for those that are visiting with us, we're still in the intro, introductory part of, of the series on end times. It'll take us a while, at least it takes me a while to get through it. Uh, and we've been talking about Israel and talking about the land that, that was promised to Israel. And today I want to talk about the covenant that God made with Abraham concerning many things, including the land, but uh, many things, and uh, see what we can learn from it. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, it did not catch God by surprise. The Bible says that he had a plan of salvation from before the foundations of the world. He already had a plan. And he says that he, he talks to Adam and Eve and the serpent and says to them, actually he's speaking to the serpent when he says these things, I'm going, there's going to be a seed that comes from the woman that's going to bruise your head, serpent. But this is the beginning of his plan to bring redemption to a lost mankind. And we go on for a while, and God chooses a man in a country where they worship idols. And he puts his hand on him and calls him. His name is Abram, later to be called Abraham. He zeroes in on this man, even though he was an idolater, worshipped other gods. Let me make, uh, this is not part of my notes. I'm glad that God calls people before they have to get better. He calls us when we're still sinners. And that's what he's doing here with Abram. I am certainly glad that he didn't have, he did not say, you got to get straightened up before you can come to me. I'm glad he took me as I was, and he straightened me up. And he'll do the same for you if you're not there yet. But how do we know he, they worshiped other gods? Well, it's not told us in the book of Genesis that. But if you were to go to the book of Joshua, you would see that. We know in Joshua, the 20th, fourth chapter in verse 22 that it says this and Joshua said to all the people thus says the Lord God of Israel your fathers including Terah and the, the father of Abram and the father of Nahor uh, that's Nahor is the brother of uh, Abram he dwelt on the other side of the river in old times and they served other gods all right God places the call on this person and he makes some promises, some statements to him that become the beginning of a covenant that God makes with Abram. A covenant that required nothing of Abram himself in order for them to be fulfilled. God says, I'm going to do this and this and this and six things are mentioned. We'll get to those in a minute. Where was Abram when God called him? Do you know? I heard it down here. Say it louder. In, the, in Ur, in the land of Chaldeans. In the final two verses of chapter 11 of Genesis, we find Abram and his father, his father's living family, because by the time that they leave Ur, his oldest brother has died before his father dies. Uh, his name was Haran. He is uh, the one who dies before they leave the home country. They go up the Euphrates River, eventually getting to a place that's called Haran. Now that makes me wonder, was this a place that they founded and named it after their deceased brother? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't give an indication. It almost says it was already called Haran before they got there. But they live here for quite some time. In fact, they, they live here until their father, Terah, passes away. Now, 
Let's read the first verse of the next. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of your country from your, fam uh, from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. So he is asking Abram to leave his family, leave his country. Now it, notice the past tense. It says, now the Lord had said, which seems to indicate, because right now they're in Haran. He probably got the call when they were still in Ur. It's past tense. And that's what the country we're talking about uh, when in Joshua says they served other gods. Most likely was there. Now, the next, in verse 4 of that uh, particular passage, uh, Genesis 12, it says that Abraham left Haran after his father died, and he went with his wife and his nephew Lot. And they go and it, to Canaan. And in verse 6 it says they finally arrived in Canaan. So now they're in Canaan. And God says, makes this statement in the next two verses that we have here. Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. I will, these are the six promises he makes to Abraham. Abram. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's five, six different promises that he makes to Abram in that particular case. In a completely sovereign act of God, he chooses one man from the world that he's going to work through. Not deserving of it, he was an idolater. So were we, in a way, before we came to Christ. And with life-creating authority, God speaks into his life and says, this is what I'm going to do for you. And with that begins the story of the people of Israel. This is such an amazing beginning that gives me some questions, and I don't even know if I should ask these questions because they seem out of place, but I want to ask them anywhere. Anyway. Why didn't, right then, God send Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the, to save every? Why didn't he, at that moment, give the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel? The only reason I ask those questions is to point out that God is so sovereignly free, he can do anything he wants. He is the only person in the universe, well, the universe is too small. He's the only person in all, how would I say it? He's the only person that exists, that has absolute freedom and has no problem with the consequence of the chooses, choices he makes. You and I don't have that always. He does. So, why we might say, well, why did you pick Ab Abraham or Abram? God had a plan. And he wants us to realize that he always has a plan, even for your life, when he called you and me. The reason I chose that one question is, why didn't he start the salvation right there in the Great Commission? Rather than 2,000 years the up and down with the, with the nation of Israel, contrary to our own expectations, or maybe our, uh, yeah, our own expectations, and for his own good purposes, God set his favor upon a single man. And commenced an amazing 2,000 year history in the world that in the fullness of time, according to Galatians 4 verse 4, would bring to us Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of all mankind. 
the verses that we just read in chapter 12. God makes a covenant which includes promises to Abraham. What were those promises? Let me put the six of them on the screen. First one. From Abraham would come a great nation. Number two. God would bless him. Number three. His name would be great. Number four. Abraham himself would be a blessing. Number five. Special circumstances would occur where he, God, would bless those who bless Abraham and curse him that curses Abraham. And number six, these blessings would extend to all the families of the earth. You can put them in three different categories. The first one is, he has personal promises made specifically to Abraham. Secondly, he has the national promises made to Abraham's seed. And third, let me make this statement. I believe that the covenant God made with Abraham, Abram, then became Abraham. He becomes Abraham in chapter 17. Uh, was unconditional and eternal. I really believe that. In other words, it's a, it's a covenant he made with Abraham and his descendants that would never die, would never go away. And I know that there are people that would dis disagree with me on this issue. Uh, there are some. I, I don't know how many. Because uh, I, I, I know that there are people who believe the church has replaced Israel in the plan of God, and I don't believe that. The church has a separate identity with God. He has a covenant with us as well. But he hasn't abandoned the Jews. Genesis 17 says this. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations. Or, excuse me, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. The very next verse also says, uses the phrase everlasting possession, again, speaking of the land. How do we know that this is everlasting, besides the words that you see right there, and will not be revoked sometime down the line? There are many scriptures in, in the Bible that, in, that corroborate that it is irreplaceable, unstoppable, but I want to take you to just one passage, and it's in Psalm 105. Psalm 105. I'll read that in just a moment. In these verses, I think God has made a very unique commitment to a human being that is so positive, so powerful and so strong, I don't think it can be denied. Let's read what it says there. He remembers his covenant forever. The words which he commanded to a thousand, for a thousand generations. I mean, I'm going to stop right there. There's a two or three places where the phrase a thousand generations are found in scripture. A thousand generations, if you take any 30, 30 years to each generation, that's 30,000 years. We haven't come close to 10% 10 of that since he, would, he called Abraham. This is a covenant that goes on and on and on. Now verse 9. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed to Jacob for a statute, Israel for an everlasting 
covenant. I think this is an amazing passage. I know of no other place in the Bible where the use of words are so powerful. You could use words like covenant, word, commandment, oath, statutes, everlasting covenant. And the language here is so strong that I can't see how anybody can take it any other way. Every covenant of God represents the solemn word of him, a commitment that he makes. But on this one, he further describes it as an everlasting covenant. It cannot be forgotten or for, for, uh, changed or removed. Furthermore, in addition to the word, we're told that he confirms it by an oath. Now, why would God, isn't his word enough? He doesn't lie. But he thought, thought so, so strongly for this issue of the land that I'm talk, we're talking about here and the promises given to Abraham and his its descendants. Thought so strongly about it that he confirmed it with an, with an oath. What does it mean for an oath? And to get the definition of that, we have to go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and verses 17 and 18. I'm going to go ahead and start reading. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise. He's talking about Abraham. He started talking about Abraham earlier in, in this chapter 6 of Hebrews. Let me read that again. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed by an oath, goes on to say, that by two immutable, and the word immutable I put there in parentheses, I think I did, unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation. So what do we have here? Two things showing that God never lies. The first is his word. Second, an oath. And that's what he's talking about here. So this is what he is, means by when he's talking about an oath. So if you go back to... I want to make, let me add, put it this way. What is it that he is so adamant about and so strongly uh, asserting when he makes a statement, a promise, and adds an oath to it? And the next verse that we uh, in Psalm 105 gives us that answer. Psalm 105, verse 11, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as an allotment of your inheritance. So why he is being so strong is that this land is something that forever belongs to Abraham's seed. He made a commitment. He goes on in that verse, the, the verses 8 through, excuse me, uh, yeah, 8 through, through 10 that we read a few minutes ago. Let me see if I have it on a slide. I'm gonna, he makes this promise to Abraham, and then he goes on and names through whom it is to be. Through Isaac, not Ishmael, not the sons of Keturah, which we'll talk about in a future lesson, but through Jacob, not Esau, and to the tribes of Israel. This, he says, he, he makes that promise through Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and their descendants. So he, he narrows the scope of which lineage of Abraham is receiving this. Now, one of the arguments that sometimes people raise in saying that God is no longer dealing with the Jews is that they rejected Jesus Christ. That they failed God. Therefore, God took the blessings off of him, off of them, and transferred them to the, to the church. 
every time I hear that argument, I, because I'm also a student of church history, I go back through church history and says, haven't we been just as unfaithful as Israel were during their times? I, all of the, the different things that, are, that the church has done that was unfaithful, the, the idolatry, the, uh, the anti-Semitism, the uh, squabbling that we have before, and, and actually turning our face against God. We, I believe, have been just as unfaithful. Thank the Lord. He still loves us. Thank the Lord that he didn't give up on me when I did things that... Uh, he was not pleased with. Every one of us have a testimony such as that, where God has taken us, he called you and me, but we weren't always faithful after that moment. There have been times and time, maybe I should speak just to myself, not to you. There have been time after time that I failed God. And yet, just like the Jews, that any time they repented, God was there to take them back. When I repented, God was there to take me back. And the same can happen to you. And if you're doing something that you think disappoints God, go back to him. Don't run from him. Go back to him, because he will take you back as quickly as you repent.